Welcome back to the class on textile finishing. Let's see what have we done till now. We tried to understand that what is the need for a softening treatment. We are talking about textile softeners and soft finish. The mechanism, what is the way in which we do, generally we understood that you have to reduce the friction between the fibers, between the yarns and that would result in softening. We try to generally broadly classify softeners and uh, the surface active agents and the emulsion formation, the need for emulsion formation also we try to understand. And we did give some examples of anionic softeners which obviously have the hydrophile as an anion and rest of course the hydrophobe which is supposed to give us the lubrication or reduction in the surface friction, that is right. So, we continue with the soft finishing uh, in this part of the lecture and today we will try to talk about three types of uh, cationic, amphoteric and non-ionic softeners. All these softeners are in some way have an embedded hydrophile along with a hydrophobe. So, let us say first we spend some time on uh, cationic softeners. So, if somebody asks what is the essential part Obviously, it looks cation. If it has got the cation, then it is a cationic softener. Where obviously, we should not forget that there has to be a hydrophobe. You know, it is the hydrophobe which is the softener part. The nature of the hydrophile is cation, and therefore, it is a cationic softener. Okay, that's very simple. In some way, we have to introduce a positive charge into in the molecule. If that can be done, then it will be uh, considered as a cationic softener. So, two parts, one is a hydrophobe, which is a long chain fatty compound connected with a hydrophile, which must be a cation, is right? Okay. It so happens that this is one of the most important class of softeners. A lot of textile people would like to have it. Why? Why would you like to have this? So, this cationic, we are talking about softeners, right? substantive. So, it is believed that these cationic softeners are substantive. They like the textile and therefore, the chances are that the wash fastness of such type of compounds on a textile is going to be better, right. That is one part. And so, people like it. And why there are some they are supposed to be uh, substantive. Let us have a look at the process. This during dyeing or other processes that you may have done on the wet chemical processing, that whenever you immerse a textile fabric in water, it has been probably told to you that it assumes certain amount of negative charge. So, this is true. If this is true, then if the fabric surface has a slight negative charge, then the positive cation or cationic compound like a cationic softener would obviously be attracted towards the surface. That is an interesting part. So, it becomes substantive. And because of that also, the fastness properties are 
pretty good. Now let us see what are we talking about. There is a term which you may have heard called the zeta potential, zeta potential. Now this is an interesting uh, potential which in some way either helps or restricts the diffusion of chemicals in solutions, in the fibers if they are being transmitted, diffused, solubilized in a aqueous solution. So, we are looking at things. You understand a large number of chemical processing systems are based on aqueous solutions, whether, whether it is dyeing or it is applying any other chemical like a softener. So, they are generally in the aqueous medium including what we did before was the anti crease or crease resistant finishing treatment. So, what happens then? In case we are dependent on this exhaustion diffusion through the surface, then this potential becomes an important component in determining the process conditions. So, as defined in general, this potential is the potential difference across boundaries. Let us say solids and liquids. Now, we are talking about solids and liquid, it could be a particle which is suspended in, in let us say an aqueous system or in our case it could be a textile which is a solid which uh, is now in an aqueous system. So, obviously, there is a phase difference, there are boundaries. So, you have a solid and a liquid. So, you have a liquid solid interface type situation. So, that is one interesting thing. It is also defined as a measure of electric charge on the particles that are suspended in a liquid. Now, in our case, we are talking about water and textile as a solid, but theoretically this is defined for any solid and any liquid. Based on their nature, so in it is also a value that can be used to describe a double layer property of a colloidal dispersion. So, something is there, let us say you get a negative charge on a surface and something positive will collect around the particle. For example, if you have a particle which let us say develops some type of a negative charge on the surface. Remember, now we are talking about surface. So, if there are positive particles around let us say a cation is available, then obviously it will get attracted to this positive charge and you get what we call as a electrical double layer. Now, this sometimes can be important if you remember we add let us say in a direct dyeing through an exhaust process, we add electrolytes like a globe of salt to create such an electrical double layer so that a good molecule which we are interested in may like to diffuse inside if particularly like a direct dye which also has a negative charge otherwise it would have been repelled all right so this is an interesting proposition so like anything else it can be measured in millivolts and also known as electrokinetic potential. That means, you need some motion also whenever there is a motion. So, there is a kinetic involved and so, you will get this uh, change in the surface, uh, let us say charge, very mild, but it does work. Now, as far as textiles are concerned, let us see. 
So one important thing is at the interface of electrically charged textile fabric, an aqueous solution of electrolyte, surfactants, dyes can form an electrical double layer, all right, can form like we just saw in any particle. So moving one of these two charges or charged surfaces would result in, result in some kind of a potential difference and if this potential difference obviously will be seen in a double layer. So if a dye has to diffuse, if some compound has to come to a surface, if some com compound is resisted from a surface, you may be interested in that also, then there is definitely an importance in the wet processing of textile of this so called electrokinetic properties, okay, that is an important part. More, what more? That this is not a constant value, it is not like a thermal conductivity of a material or a density of a fiber. So, there is not a constant value, but it does talk about in a given situation how the functional groups, the hydrophobicity or the hydrophilicity of the textile will result in some type of a electrical surface charge, right. So, this is a dynamic system. So, let us say uh, just for getting some idea as to what exactly are the values and what do we mean by that. So, let us say we talk about cotton fabric. In general, when you immerse in water, it generates some kind of a negative charge, that is in general. But if you look at wool, so this does not immediately behave in the way the cotton has behaved. No, it depends on the pH. If the wool fabric or a fiber or a yarn is submerged, immersed in water, if the pH is neutral, then it gets a negative charge. But if it is acidic pH, then we know it gets a positive charge, that is why acid dyes can go in, right? Do we do acid dyeing in acidic pH, right? True, is it not? So, when we said the last statement that this is not a constant value. So, if the nature of the charge itself says, how can the value be constant, right? So, it will depend on the process conditions. That is one important thing you may like to note. Similarly, nylon which is a polyamide, wool is a polypeptide, but generally in acidic medium, nylon also gets a positive charge and therefore, it is dyed by an acid dye in the in acidic medium, but in neutral you have a negative charge. Acrylic in general may be found to have negative charge. That means that every textile and every condition may not get a negative charge. So, one should be aware of this, is that right? However, it is interesting to note at a pH which is 10, most of them have negative zeta potential. That is interesting. So, if you have to do anything around this pH, then you will find well most of them are negative. So, you must add or subtract from the bath type of ions which you do not require. You can remove them. If you require them, then you have to and they are similar to shard, then you have to do something 
make an electrical double layer for something else. Okay? Like when you want to do, as I said, a negatively dyed, negatively charged direct dye would have would find it difficult to penetrate the cotton because it also develops negative charge. But if we put electrolyte, then double layer is created, the charge in some sense is neutralized and the dye can then relatively easily diffuse into the fiber. So, what are we saying? That these values or shall we say the zeta potential or electrokinetic potential does play a role. So, in case we find that our substance is generally going to get a negatively charged surface, then obviously cationic softeners will be attracted. Is that right? So, if it does not, then you have to know what is to be done. So, if you look at the importance of cationic softeners is that because most of them around neutral or around little alkaline pH would be negatively charged. So, they would have a tendency to go and adhere and then after that either they diffuse or deposit onto the surface. Right? So, let us say a compound like this which is amine based compound has got very satisfied arrangement. How does we get a positive charge? It can get a positive charge in acidic pH and then what you will get? You will get because of the acidic nature you will get a proton and then you will get this positive charge. And so, if you are in some conditions of these kinds, then you will be able to easily use these compounds. So, you will get some positive charge. For example, of another cationic softener which has a structure like this. So, what will happen here? So, you have nitrogen and then some R which is, I am just repeating what is written there. And another one also is similar looking. So, it already had a hydrogen. When you go to the acidic medium, then the protonation will take place and another uh, hydrogen will come into play and then you will get. So, these are the examples of softeners. So, from where the softening effect is coming? It is coming from here. The interesting part also here is that uh, if you consider this as one hydrophobe, and if it is the same one, this also in a hydrophobe. So, the cation or a cationic group is embedded, but not at the end. So, it is something like you have a hydrophobe and a hydrophile which is cationic and another hydrophobe which is in the center, but it still works. After all, what is your idea? Idea is that it should be water soluble, right? Why are we making the ionic compounds? Why? Because we want them to be water soluble. Do you realize something here? That this cation 
is getting generated in an acidic medium. So, if it is an alkaline medium or a neutral medium, the same compound may behave differently. There may not be any ion. So, now this type of a compound therefore is, if we call it pH dependent. So, the nature of the cation is or, or generation shall we say generation cation is pH dependent. That is something which we have to realize, but may not like it, right. So, if you have a process situation where the softener has to be used, which is a cationic softener and the process conditions are such that they are acidic, then it is the and it is an acidic condition and generally the surface for example, has a negative charge and it will get attracted. Right. So, there are other class of cationic softeners which are dependent on quaternary salts. Okay. Now, here it has an embedded cation. Now, this compound has got all the portions connected and because of this structure which is quaternary, this compound always has a positive charge. This is interesting. So, if one of the R's or most of the R's are hydrophobes, then you have a softener which would have an embedded cation and is not going to be pH dependent. Does it make sense? So, this class of compound therefore, is advantages. It is a cation, so it has some advantage, some affinity for the substrate and this is going to be available almost at all pH unless and until you destroy the compound, which obviously you will not do. So, another quaternary compound is given here, which has a positive charge embedded because of these four groups which have been attached. Okay. And so, this will be also the advantage we consider of this type is pH independent more or less and affinity so good affinity and pH independence are the advantages so cationic softeners therefore are an important class of softeners which are almost used in every process house. The application, exhaustion, yes of course, you can if the bath is such or the process is such which requires exhaustion to take place and if it can easily be added, then this is a good way to add through an exhaust process. Of course, you can add these compounds by pad dry in a pad dry cure process also, but remember the curing is going to be important for the other chemical. Let us say if it is applied through 
uh, or along with a cross-linking agent which is going to be cured. So, the curing will be there for the cross-linking agent, but the cationic softener does not chemically covalently bonded. Is it right? So, you must remember that. Comparability, well, what are we talking about? Compatibility will depend on if you are adding in a bath, what is the charge there of the other chemicals. If the charge is negative on the textile, you are very happy about it. If there are many other chemicals which have to be added and they also have neg they are negative charge, then what will happen? Yeah, it may not be the best situation. Is that okay? It will not be the best situation because it can react with that and because it has got a large hydrophobe, it can precipitate and you do not want precipitated systems that would not be a good for any kind of reactions. Do you understand? Otherwise, they are pretty compatible. Of course, when such a situation comes where one of the agent is going to likely to react, so then the other process is separate process. You know, softening is an important thing and if somebody believes that you can get value and lot of value, to your textile material, then you can also use it as a separate process. In that case, there is no issue of compatibility in a particular bath because that process is over. Now, you have another, the textile is already partly finished or one part of the finish is over or dyed and now you are applying a softener. So, this function will be served by applying by almost like a pad dry process, you know, it will not have to go for a cure process, that can be done, you do not have to go for an exhaust. There are other class, not so important class, but interesting class, we are called the amphoteric softeners, amphoteric and what does amphoteric mean? This means that you have both anion and cation in the same molecule. If you have anion and cation in the same molecule, then you will have an amphoteric softener. Do you remember any molecule? which we use in textile, proteins, silk is a protein, all right, wool is a protein, so in a wool you can think of a cation and an anion on the same molecule, so we remember that because of this, at one level of pH it behaves in one way, at the other pH it behaves another way and of course, there can be a balance at a particular given pH, there can be a balance. The number of negative ions could be equal to positive ions that is possible at a particular pH, which will be different for different proteins. Silk will have a different pH, the wool will have different pH, other proteins will have different pH. Sometimes 
you may have heard about this term called the isoelectric point. Alexoelectric point or isoelectric pH. So, that is where the charge on the molecule, the negative charge on the molecule is equal to the positive charge on the molecule. So, different pH, different behave. So, these kind of things also will behave almost like that. One of the interesting compounds which is used for many purposes, softeners we are talking about here. They could be a surfactant, they could be any surfactant which also can be uh, used in like a betaine. So, there are surfactants, they are important compounds from the point of view that they in our case are giving softening. In the case of a soft uh, surfactant, it can give the the property of a surfactant which could be reducing the surface tension or doing some dispersion or any such things. So, all that is possible. So, you can see you have a possibility of this and you obviously have this interesting compounds. Another compound which is similar is sulfur betaine based compound ok. So, because of the sulfonic group instead of a carboxyl group you have a sulfonic group. And so, we have another class of compound which is not ionic. So, you had the amphoteric, you had the cationic and you had the anionic hydrophile, but a hydrophile which is non-ionic but it is a hydrophile. So, what we are looking at a non ionic hydrophile. Of course, it will also have a hydrophobe which is the part which gives us, it gives us, it gives us the softening effect. So, important part is it does not depend on substantivity in general, it is so, wherever there are issues of compatibility, then you can add this type of softener. There are positive charges, so cationic can be added, but anionic cannot be added. If there are anionic things, then the cationic cannot be added. But here we are getting a distinct advantage of compatibility. That is why someone will go for a non ionic softener. But this is an important part which must be remembered that they would have low solubility. For example, if you have simple compounds which is let us say a steric acid that is one by itself is not or alcohol of a fatty acid. So, although the 
OH group or a COOH group are hydrophilic, but that's not enough for solubilizing unless you make it ionic and we don't want to make it ionic. If you don't want to make it ionic, then this hydrophile has to be worked around. So, in general, their solubility compared to an ionic compound is going to be less, right? We do not want them to ionize because if they ionize then, then they are either anionic or cationic which we already talked about. So, low solubility is there. So, if it is a disadvantage then it is a disadvantage. There is another uh, term which we use uh, whenever we talk about non-ionic either surfactants or softeners in some way we have accepted a softener is also like a surfactant doing a different job, right. So, there is something called a cloud point. What is a cloud point? Let us see. A cloud point is a temperature a particular temperature at which a non-ionic compound like a surfactant will phase separate, phase separate means come out. So, when it is in a solution, it looks like a single phase, two compounds, one is water, let us say, other is a non-ionic softener and you mix them up properly, it is a nice beautiful solution. Okay. Whatever we have done to the molecule of the hydrophile, we have done whatever we have done. So, there is a solubility. So, softener is soluble, but then at a temperature, it phase separates. That means, the surfactant will come out of the solution and as it comes out of solution, the solution becomes cloudy, milky. If that is what it is called the cloud point. So, at a temperature where the solution from a transparent appearance goes into a cloudy appearance, that temperature is called the cloud point. And this remember the cloud point is talked about only with respect to the non-ionic surfactants or now softeners, right. With anionic system, this cloud point is not an issue. There is nothing called a cloud point there. So, it is a new phenomena which also get associated. The two things which are important from for the point of view of a non-ionic, one is that its solubility is reduced, is lower compared to an ionic compound and it will have a temperature which is going to be limiting temperature, it is a cloud point. After all, we dissolve something so that it remains in solution. So, if your process requires higher temperature, a temperature higher than the cloud point of that non-ionic compound, then you will not be able to use this. Otherwise, it has advantage of compatibility that without irrespective of which are the type of ions present in the bath, you will be able to add it. So, everything comes with some baggage, right? So, what happens? So, this solvency or dissolution of a non-ionic compound happens because some of these groups which are the hydrophile or related to the hydrophile can make hydrogen bonds with water, right. So, in a water either you make an ion so become soluble or you make hydrogen bonds. Like for example, if you add 
methyl alcohol or an ethyl alcohol in water they just become soluble right and why it becomes soluble so these compounds are able to make hydrogen bonds with water without these water molecules are making hydrogen bond with each other now if you add something like what we talked about and some alcohols of methyl and ethyl type they will also dissolve but when the methyl becomes ethyl and keeps on increasing the carbon chain and goes up to let us say C17, C18, C16, it is not water soluble. That is one part, but you have made it water soluble by using some of the groups called the ethylene oxide groups. We will just see some of the examples. So, these groups can make hydrogen bonds with water. So, they remain soluble. When you heat, increase the temperature, the first casualty is this weak hydrogen bond which has been formed with water through an ethylene oxide group would break you can call it a dehydration breaking of the hydrogen bonds and the product will phase separate out into solution and would look like cloudy right and so but this is an interesting part so this is not a one way phase change if you cool that it will go back again so what is heating heating this kinetic energy molecules will start vibrating and so the water molecule will start vibrating the softener molecule will start vibrating the hardened bond is the casualty if you reduce the temperature the kinetic energy goes down and then again it can dissolve so nothing there is a compound is not broken down nothing has happened to the compound right so what is say it only says that these type of compounds are going to sh show some amount of phase separation after a certain temperature so your process condition or process temperature should be less than that if that is there no problem so you have seen this compound which is glycerol if you replace one of these groups by a stearic acid group then it becomes a softener okay and these groups are left free so it is one type of a non ionic softener if suppose i replace this one also and this one also with this type of a group then what will happen it will not be water soluble so even at room temperature it will not be soluble so it becomes a compound which is not going to be a useful softener okay and therefore we are not going to be doing this kind of a job but remember what we had we had one hydrophobe as a steric or a stearate of this glycerol this was the hydrophobe this actually is the hydrophobe but the hydrophile is this area which has some affinity for the water and therefore some dissolution can 
take place. But the solubility of this product is also not very high. So what do you do? Well, we say we do ethoxylation of a fatty, let's say an acid. R is important to us as a hydrophobe. Correct? But here we are now getting into another oligomeric system which is derived, synthesized from ethoxy groups and so you have ethoxylation. This number n could be if 10 to 15, you can keep on increasing, no problem, would determine the solubility. If this number or this number is large, solubility will be higher. If this number is less, smaller, solubility will be less. Is that clear? That means you can play around with the solubility of the molecule and theoretically therefore with the cloud point also. Okay. Because if there are more possibilities of getting hydrogen bonds, then the chances are it will be more soluble. So you have this hydrophile now is a long thing. Remember, we had a hydrophile like an anion. Suddenly it is water soluble. A cation, suddenly it is water soluble. But in this case, it is a non-ionic thing. You need a little longer chain. So, hydrophilic and lyophilic balance, yeah, this comes into play. Hydrophilic, lyophilic balance. You change this, it will be more soluble or less soluble, depends on what you actually are looking forward to. That is interesting, is not it? So, you have some control. You can do this from alcohols as well, but then R is the hydrophobe and this is our hydrophile. So, see this, so we have a possibility of having a non-ionic softener and its solubility can be controlled by a hydrophilic lyophilic balance. Lyophilic is the one which likes the oil which is this part. So, length of the chain if we change then we will get a different molecule and so you can play around with any limitation that you can think about. Otherwise the advantage is compatibility add to anything and use it. So, we are coming to the end of this part. What have we learned? So, we have learned about cationic softeners, we have learned about the zeta potential and its importance in textile wet processing, amphoteric which has got a cation and an anion embedded in the same molecule. Also, we have learned about the non-ionic softeners and the importance of the cloud point. Remember all these including the one which was anionic have an embedded hydrophile in the structure. Okay. In the next class when we meet we shall talk about some other softeners which may not have any embedded hydrophile, they are only hydrophobes and you have to apply those hydrophobes to textile surfaces, is that right? So next time when we meet, this is what we are going to talk about, till then have fun, thank you.